right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. But this week in particular is a really, really exciting week, probably our most exciting week of the entire school year. And I wanna highlight why before we dive in with our specific speaker today. So this is my first time giving a land acknowledgement. It's something that a lot of you might have experienced in events over the last few years. It's a really exciting transition as we continue to highlight the amazing contributions of Indigenous peoples to Canada, past, present, and future. And so, as we gather, we are reminded that throughout Canada, we're situated on Indigenous land, both ceded treaty land and unceded land. This land is steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people today. As a country, we have a responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live and work. And today, I acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and neutral people whose traditional territory I'm broadcasting from. So it's land acknowledgements like that that actually highlight those people to me over the last year and a half. Um, we also work with the Vancouver Aquarium. They always highlight the amazing peoples of that part of uh, Canada as well. And I hope that that is something that encourages all of you to keep the learning going, uh, get excited and find out more about the amazing people, again, past and present, that live on this incredible land that many of us call Canada. Today, we are diving back in with Secret Path Week. So all week long, we have been highlighting amazing speakers from across Canada um, as part of a national movement commemorating the legacies of Gord Downey and Chani Wenjack. The Gord Downey and Chani Wenjack Fund would like to inspire all Canadian classrooms to use this week to answer Gord Downey's call to action and do something as we share knowledge towards meaningful reconciliation. So today, we are joined live by Chelsea Vowell. She is joining us in Edmonton, and she does it all. She is a Métis woman. She is a mother of six, an educator at the University of Alberta, a podcast producer, an author, a blogger, and more. She's done so many incredible things to help highlight Indigenous history, language, and more with communities across Canada. I'm really excited to have her today. I hope you guys are excited whether you're joining live or on YouTube to hear her story and to learn a little bit and ask some great questions. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today, Chelsea, and take us away. Dance. Uh, Chelsea Vaughn and Sigason, Mantusa Gaigenek Nitotsin, Egua, um, Nivigan Uta, Masquatsi was Gaigenek and Olds, Otpem Suasque Umania, Bo Apitagosan uh, Esque Umania, Egua Nigotwasek Nitotansen. So, my name is Chelsea Vaughn, I'm from Lac Saint Anne, I'm Metis, and I am working and living right now, I mean, where we all are in, in our homes mostly, but uh, in Edmonton. And I uh, have a bit of a presentation to, to show you, to go through before we start some questions. I wanna spend most of our time on questions. So I'm just gonna get this up. All right. Okay, so um, I guess I wanna focus on the fact that like, honestly, you know, people, people say these things, they're like, oh, she's an author and this and that, but really my life is just a series of cool projects. And so if I could, if I could like impart one piece of advice to you, it would be just to do the thing. If you're, you're interested in something, just, just do the thing. Okay. All right. So, um, this is the information that I gave you. This is the name of my community, Manto Sakaigan, which is uh, Lac Saint Anne uh, in English. And uh, I'm Métis writer, educator, mom to six. So I'm always exhausted, uh, always frazzled. I have, I have, uh, you know, 18 year olds, and I have little toddlers in, in the house, usually uh, screaming around somewhere above me. Um, and I get to teach the Cree language, which is called Nekia uh, That's what I do at the University of Alberta right now. And it's honestly like my dream job. My whole life, that's all I wanted to do was have time to do nothing but study Cree and teach it. It's it's awesome. It's the best thing in the world. All right. So how did how did sort of everything start for me? Um, I'm not going to go back to like when I was born. I'm going to go back to 2011. And this was sort of the beginning of Idle No More. And uh, it, it started like this. I started arguing with people on the internet. So um, people were making all sorts of racist comments under all the articles that were published online about indigenous peoples. It could literally be, you know, um, native man gets hit by a car while crossing the street. Okay, terrible, right? But underneath the comments were like, yeah, but he doesn't pay taxes and he gets a free house and um, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, guy got hit by a car, who cares? his tax status or if he gets a free house and all this stuff. And so I would argue with people about it. I would say, look, you know, this is a myth. You're, you're, you're regurgitating myths. And, uh, and, and I would argue with people. And then I would see like Joe Blow 27, right? 
he would be he would be in an article uh, commenting, and I would I would give him all the information I had about you know native people paying taxes, and then I would see that same guy Joe Blow twenty seven in another article saying the same thing, and I was like I already told you this information, so I decided to put this into a blog post instead of arguing in the comments. And then every time somebody made that argument, native people don't pay, pay taxes, I would just give them the link, right? So I did that and one of my pieces went viral, like really viral. Okay, so I wrote a thing um, that made a lot of people angry, uh, but a lot more people loved it. So I started talking about Attawapiskat, which is a Cree community in Northern Ontario. People were like, wow, they have, they've been given so much money. How come they're still, you know, experiencing so many bad things? And I, and I broke down, you know, the amount of money and, and, and showed how it was being used and how it was insufficient. Um, so after that, I started writing more and more articles about, um, you know, all sorts of things, questions that people have. Do, do Indigenous peoples get free houses? Um, do we do we not pay taxes? Um, is it true that uh, there's a gene that Indigenous peoples have that make them more um, likely to become alcoholics? Things like that. So I started writing that. And down here, I was like, I was also avoiding exams. So don't, don't do like me. Um, a lot of my projects are, I call them procrasto inspiration. So um, I, I have ADHD and uh, I, I often get really, really hyper-focused on projects. I'm like super into it uh, to the exclusion of everything else, including deadlines. And oddly enough, I get super hyper-focused when deadlines are nearing. So it's like, oh, you have this big essay due, better go and do this huge project. Um, not a great use of time, but sometimes it does end up bringing you to cool places. So all that writing eventually turned into this book, Indigenous Rights, which is, um, and it's a guide to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit uh, issues in Canada. It's It was really cool to put together. So there's, there's 31 chapters. Um, I, I do a bunch of myth busting and information about treaties and this and that. It's sort of like a 101 introduction to Indigenous issues. Um, originally I'd pitched a book that was like 60 chapters and the publish, the publisher was like, we can't sell a book that thick. So there's a lot of things that I didn't get to talk about in this book, um, that eventually maybe I will do in another one. Um, also around this time, uh, I had other deadlines to avoid. So I made a silly video game called, I don't know, idle no more blockade. Uh, I, this was like feverishly done over three days. Um, it's an RPG game. It's real cheesy. Uh, you play this young uh, Cree land defender named Sakawail, um, who has to raise help to oppose a pipeline that's being built across Sundance fields. So some some people picked up on this and were like, she's she's trying to encourage the youth to like rebel and not respect the law. And I thought that was funny because like, you know, these these kinds of projects, like pipelines or things like that, that are done without, you know, prior informed consent of, uh, free prior and informed consent of Indigenous peoples violate the law and the land. So anyway, all right, around that time too, I also started co-hosting a podcast with my bud Molly Swain and uh, that was wild. So we, we go from a podcast to a land trust and I wanted to talk about how that progressed. Okay, so our podcast is called Otbem Suasquewa Kitsigisigok, which means Métis in Space. And it's an indigenous feminist sci-fi podcast. Okay, it's, it's we really do focus on sci-fi. We explore portrayals of indigeneity in, in sci-fi, um, you know, series, movies, sometimes even videos. Uh, we're both huge nerds and we just started this for fun in 2015. But it soon turned into something more. Originally, when we started, we thought, mm, nobody but our moms will listen to this. Turns out our moms don't actually listen to it, but it became much more popular than we expected. So this is our cool logo. I love it so much. Uh, we joined the Indian and Cowboy Podcast Network, uh, which is run by Ryan McMahon. Um, and we've just wrapped up our fifth season. So we have over 50 episodes and we, we do more than just critique pop culture portrayals of indigenous peoples. We do a lot of world building and that, that came about because, you know, all of this was happening during Idle No More and Idle No More was really this kind of tumultuous time. Um, people were talking about indigenous issues in the public sphere in ways that I hadn't seen on, you know, um, before, except I guess the only thing I could compare it to is I was around during Oka. That's how old I was. Uh, so, you know, kind of during that time, but this, this time indigenous peoples were, were leading 
the conversation. And so we were thinking about what what would what would our end goal be? Like if we could have, you know, we're a post-apocalyptic people. Indigenous peoples are all post-apocalyptic. We've gone through world-ending events and we still managed to survive. So we 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 rejected the idea that things have to get worse, that things have to become so much more ap ap apocalyptic before Indigenous peoples and the rest of humanity could have sort of, you know, our version of utopia, like good times, okay? Everything, everything's great. So if we want that, if we want those those good times and we want, you know, a life that's good for everybody, what would that look like and how would we get there? And so in our podcast, we ended up doing sort of silly plays and things like that and imagining ourselves in the future um, in ways that were, were good and healthy and relatable and all of that. So that that became a big part of our podcast. We weren't just watching shows anymore and throwing popcorn at the screen and being like, boo, hiss. Now we were like, let's imagine 350 years into the future. So that sort of thinking, um, that world building that we were doing went into a chapter in, in this graphic novel, This Place 150 Years Retold. And it's a really cool resource. If you haven't seen it, it sort of goes through, it, it, it takes, you know, stories by different Indigenous writers, you know, over the past 150 years of, uh, you know, Canadian history, because this came out on the 150th, um, you know, anniversary or birthday of, of Canada. And it, it talks about these different events from uh, the points of view of people like, you know, back back in history, you know, up to the present day. And then I got to do the final chapter, which was a, uh, you know, a, a futuristic chapter. And this is my character, Wabanatsagos. So, Kitaskinao, 2350. So, Kitaskinao in Cree means our land, like all of us. Our land, our earth. And that's what it's referring to. Um, so, it's about a Cree Metis girl. She lives in this decolonized world in 2350. And the cool thing about this is, like, I, I don't know if you're Star Trek fans or anything, but, you know, in Star Trek and a lot of sci-fi, when you are in the extreme future, they never really explain, like, in detail how they got there, right? They they just they just go there. You're in the 24th century. Everything's great. So we wanted to do that, too. We just wanted to be like, okay, we're going to skip over the details. We're going to go and talk about this awesome place we want to live in, and then maybe we'll backfill it. We'll figure out how to get there. Um, so... Wabanatsagos travels back in time to understand the mentality of people who left Earth for Mars back in the 21st century, aka now. You know, so the idea is that people in, in today's time, um, rather than trying to find solutions to, you know, catastrophic uh, ecological collapse, to mass human migration and all the problems that we're seeing, instead of trying to stay here and fix it, they just like run off to Mars and live there for 300 years and don't change their mentality. And eventually they come back to Kitaskinal and uh, cause a bit of conflict. So that story is about that. And it was very cool because I, you know, I write, but I don't draw, I didn't draw this. So I had to work with an artist and, and like tell them, this is what I want. I want a futuristic city and I want traditional stuff. And I want, you know, I want, I want the, the traditional and the futuristic to live side by side because why not? And, and uh, Tara Otterbert, the the artist, drew this amazing world that made the story so much cooler. Now it's not just my story. She's put her work into it as well. And then we had to have a colorist come in, do all the colors. We had to have somebody who comes in and puts all the words in. Anyway, if you ever get a chance to work on a graphic novel, highly recommend. It's a great collaborative project, super fun. And you have all these really talented people that bring their art and their perspectives into the project. And all of a sudden it's more than you could have ever um, envisioned yourself. So this is this is us um, cosplaying ourselves because why not? Uh, so now Molly Swain and I are writing a whole graphic novel based in this Métis in space universe where we are, we're really looking for, um, you know, getting to a decolonized future together, like all of us, right? All of human beings, all non-human beings, the land, the air, the water. So um, yeah, graphic novels are really cool, very complicated to put together, takes a lot of time. Um, that's my excuse. COVID hasn't helped either. All this to say that we should have been done the script by now, but we're working on it. It'll it'll happen slowly. Um, one of the things I'm really trying to do these days after you know six months of, of a pandemic is just take the time to be okay and and just like, I don't know, not not worry myself so much with deadlines because 
So much of what we want to do is on hold anyway. Okay, so I'd mentioned the land trust. I'm just going to take a little sip of Muskego Wapo here, some tea. All right, so we're a, we're a podcast. We're Métis in space. We're we're nerds. We do sci-fi stuff. Um, and now we have land. How the heck did that happen? So we launched a project called Back to the Land, Two Land, Two Furious. Um, you might be able to tell that we're like sort of fans of the Fast and Furious franchise. It's so cheesy. Um, so we, we have long sort of discussed the need for access to land, particularly for urban uh, Indigenous youth. One of the things that is happening right now is there's, you know, this resurgence in Indigenous indigenous culture and people are always saying go back to the land go back to the land well a lot of a lot of us who live in the cities it's it's hard to get out to the land and the land isn't always available or welcoming so we wanted to, we we needed a piece of land for research cultural activities education we want to bring folks from um you know particularly inner city youth so black and indigenous um in uh inner city youth out there to go do you know land-based learning and uh, in order to do that, we needed land. So we we decided to start a fundraiser. Um, again, probably avoiding something. We're like, uh, we have this deadline coming up. Let's let's uh, raise money for land. We figured it would take about a year, maybe more, to raise enough land to buy, uh, ma raise enough money to buy some land. It ended up happening in a few weeks. We had what we call like a settler angel from uh, across the medicine line down in the United States donated enough money for us to buy 160 acres of land uh, in Lac St. Anne County in my territory. Uh, it, it has a small lake on it with swans, geese, loons, ducks. It's, it's really cacophonous. We went out there and there's so many species of, of waterfowl out there. It's, it's, it's an ecological treasure. Uh, now we we had all sorts of plans to get out there and start, you know, doing amazing things. But again, COVID, we don't even have a road onto the land yet, and to get the the road built is going to take a bit. So things have had to slow down, which probably is good for um, our mental and physical health, to be honest. So now we have a land trust, and and the land trust means that we don't personally own this land. The land is held in trust for future generations. So um, it's it's a way under settler colonial law, uh, using private property, which we're not wild about, because we really do want um, the rematriation of lands to Indigenous peoples, we want land back. But we decided to go this route because it does provide protection for the land um, over a series of generations so that we can't lose it if we become very poor, you know, which is a reality. A lot of Métis are landless because uh, when the Canadian government was trying to deal with us and extinguish our uh, our Aboriginal rights, they they handed out script. They handed out land. They're like, "Here's your land back." <laughs> like, um, and then speculators came and took the land, stole the land. So a lot of us ended up without any land anymore, um, and we want to avoid repeating history. All right. And the other thing that I've been doing is, like I said, I've been teaching the Cree language at the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. And I did my master's degree there in Métis Futurisms. So again, world building. OK, my thesis included short stories where I reimagined Métis people in the past. So I have a story about a Rougarou uh, shape changing uh, woman back in, you know, the 1800s. Uh, and I imagine what happened if Canada could never expand it into the West. And so we were still independent peoples. Um, you know, I talk about a, a Métis superhero who has uh, incredible strength, but nobody who's who's unrelated to him could remember him. So he can never become very famous. Um, I, I talk about, you know, um, using nanotechnology to help people learn their languages, all sorts of things. So you imagine futurisms are not just about the future, they're about the past, present and the future. And so now I am expanding that thesis, those short stories into a book, which is going to be published by Arsenal Pulp Press next year, uh, which of course I'm behind on as well. So it's okay, you can be behind on things and still eventually get them done. All right, um, what have I done other than that in between everything else? Well, I've done a lot of talking over the years. I, I do a lot of talks. I talk to politicians, I talk to doctors, lawyers, teachers, farmers, students, just a whole whack of pe people. Anybody who wants me to come in and sort of talk to them about indigenous issues, about you know our hopes for the future and what kinds of things that we wanna see now, um, I do that. I'm a little bit on social media, uh, I've, I've been on Twitter for a really long time, but you can see I'm trying to get off social media 
Uh, <laughs> it's every time I, I, I think I'm out, they suck me back in. But um, yeah, that's, that's it. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, I've been doing a lot of things, but now I kind of, right now, I just want to hear questions from you folks. Yeah. Well, thank you so, so much, Chelsea. What a fantastic presentation. You are a wildly creative person and we should all aspire to do half of what you do. Um, so we're going to dive in with questions, guys. For anyone who's joining on YouTube or Facebook, if you want to let me know in the chat bar uh, where you're joining from, share some questions there. We'll take as many as we can. What we'll do to start is go to Ms. Hall's class. Ms. Hall's class is uh, grade 12, joining us in Toronto. Uh, Ms. Hall, if you want to come into the broadcast and uh, share a question on behalf of your students, go for it. Come on in. Just demute your mic and you're good to go. Hi there. I'm just waiting for my students to respond to the chat. But thank you very much for that amazing presentation. And um, I have a question for myself. Um, uh, what might you recommend for youth to do um, to get involved in um, in the broader kind of issues that are going on um, currently? You know, specifically talking about <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the there's so many things going on in Mcmaggy and yeah, land back lane and stuff. Yeah. Well, so I think um, social media gets vilified a lot. Even I do it, I, you know, because it it's a massive time suck sometimes. And, and it can be a place of extreme negativity. On the other hand, it's also a place where people can share information about what's happening, like, like in real time. Stuff that you, you don't necessarily learn about um, in mainstream media until maybe a day or two later. And it's often coming from the people themselves that are, that are engaged in, in whatever sort of situation is happening. And what I do find amazing is that people online, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking about what's happening in Mi'kmaq and in uh, Mi'kmaq territory right now, you know, this tension between, you know, fisher, fishermen and, you know, non-native fishermen and stuff like that. And what's that all about? How do you get that information? And what you'll see is you have independent Mi'kmaq media on the ground, um, you know, providing, providing all sorts of information. People put together reading lists. They put together calls for action. They tell you what they need in the moment. Sometimes it's material supplies. They're like, hey, uh, we need tarps. We need firewood. Sometimes they, you know, they, they give you a list of readings. They're like, hey, find out more about this situation. Here's, a, here's a, the text of the treaty. Here's an interpretation of the treaty. Here's a bunch of information that will help you understand the whole situation better. Um, and those those materials are almost always, uh, you know, linked to and free, right? So students who are interested in that that topic can go read um, those fantastic reading lists that people are putting together, and figure out figure out like what they want to do. You know, do do they is this something that interests them? Do they want to participate in some way? Can they can they maybe show solidarity um, at their school? Um, in their communities, bring attention to it, you know, and show uh, Mi'kmaq people that that others stand with them. Those those uh, shows of solidarity are really important as well. And the thing is, is you know, it, you, you want to know what to do. Well, Indigenous peoples are always telling you. There's always there's always a list being circulated out there saying this is how you can help, and these are the different ways that you can help. So um, I do think that in for this reason, you know, social media does provide a lot of the answers that people are looking for. Yep. Fantastic. Thanks, Chelsea. And great first question, Ms. Hall. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to go to Humberside Collegiate right now for Ms. Howard's class, and then we'll take a few questions from YouTube as well. So Ms. Howard's class, come on in and uh, go for it. If you have questions for us. And if you don't, we can come back in a bit. Don't worry. I can come back in a second, guys. No worries. I know high school, I'm not necessarily running up to the, the classroom, but so I'll come back in a minute. What I'll do is take a question from Miss Neely's class joining us online. What is your favorite project you've worked on, Chelsea? If you can pick. Oh yeah. Okay. Definitely the Métis in Space podcast. So I, I started. I started it with Molly around the time that I don't know more was really um kicking off and so here we are every day talking about really hard issues you know murdered and missing indigenous women we're talking about police brutality we're talking about um you know uh trying to have the treaties respected historic injustice all of this all of these things right and it's heavy it's heavy duty it's ongoing it's it's um crisis after crisis it can get really depressing it can it can kind of bring you down so 
I, I was feeling very drained all the time, but also I, I felt like I had this huge responsibility to always respond to questions and people's calls for education. And yeah, I did. I, I it was, it was depressing. So starting the Métis Space co- podcast allowed us to have fun. And I think like Indigenous joy is, is so important and joy in general, right? We have, all of us have so many responsibilities, whether it's school, it's to our families, you know, um, we, we have these hopes and dreams that we have to work towards. Right. And that, 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 that can be, that can really put a lot of pressure on you. And if you don't find something that, that makes you happy and gives you joy, um, then it's, it's hard to keep going. And I don't say this, I don't say that you need to go find joy so that you um, produce better under capitalism or that you can like, it's not a form of self care that allows you to regenerate and do more work. It's not about that but it's really about filling you up with good relationships um, and making you feel connected. And those are relationships that you build, um, you know, cross communities. Like I'm I'm thinking about with this podcast, we met so many other indigenous nerds. We didn't know they existed. And now there's this incredible community of indigenous nerds that's always been there. And now we have people that we can work with and, and things like that. And it's, it's expanded beyond ourselves and turned into something where, you know, uh, a whole whack of Indigenous peoples are collaborating on trying to envision a better future. And if we don't have time to do that sort of thinking, we're always mired in the day-to-day, you know, struggle of just living, um, then we're never going to get to that place we want to be. So yeah, for me, it's it's sitting around watching cheesy sci-fi with Indigenous peoples in it and just laughing about the terrible portrayals. It's a love-hate relationship with these, these uh, shows. I really do love sci-fi, but sometimes I'm like, can you just can you just not? Yeah. Um, I love that you mentioned joy as, a, as sort of a central element of your own work. One of the things we've seen with Leela uh, and over the last few days on the Gord Downey Cheney Wenjack Fund Secret Path Week has been uh, just pure joy and such an exciting yeah. story. So check out our YouTube channel if you want to see more stories like that. Métis in Space, I brought it up in a banner on the bottom. So if you want to check that out, uh, please do. It's a really amazing uh, program. So yeah, we'll check into that. Now, before I go back to Humberside and some of our YouTube questions, so you create a lot of stuff with some really uh, fantastic Indigenous representation, and you talk about poking fun at some of the bad examples of it in sort of mainstream media. Are there good examples in mainstream media? Is there any show or podcast or movie that does a good job of this in your estimation? No, no. You know, it's funny because, um, as you know, we, we've, we've done this over a series of years now, and we found that around sort of the late 80s, early 90s, representation actually started to be be better. And then it went downhill again to stereotypes. So I would say in terms of uh, maybe not mainstream, although it's becoming more mainstream, more Indigenous creators are, are now the ones propelling and creating the content. So you've got Jeff Barnaby, who sort of really dabbles in horror. Um, you know, you, you've got all sorts of amazing uh, stories coming out of, uh, you know, out of the North. So Inuit creators, um, you know, people doing sci-fi and stuff. And it's, it's all, it's all native people telling sci-fi stories, um, or, you know, not just sci not just sci-fi, right. But those, if you can seek out those indigenous creators, when we have a chance to tell our own stories, it's so awesome. It's so much better than somebody doing it for us. So, um, the great thing is, is that, you know, it really is a question of money. So please billionaires throw money at our uh, indigenous creators. Uh, But we are seeing more and more indigenous content uh, in the mainstream. And I think that's really exciting. I mean, we uh, we've got this trickster series now. Uh, I love that trilogy by Eden Robinson. And now it's on CBC gem. If you get a chance to watch it, like it's, 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 it's irreverent, it's um, scatological, it's scary. You know, it, none of this noble savage stuff. It's, I, think it's, I think it's something that's going to appeal to, um, to youth and adults uh, alike and, and provide a different perspective of what it's like to be an indigenous person and to show our, the variety of our worldviews. So I'm very, very excited about the fact that we're making our own stuff now. Fantastic. Trickster, so I just put that up. Uh, so it's not the trickster on, on C- CBC, it's just Trickster. Check it out, 2020. Um, really fantastic, right? So I'm glad we got a chance to bring that up. And I'm trying to bring up everything you mentioned on screen as much as, as quick as I can. So I'll keep it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> um, so we're going to, going to go back to Humberside. If you guys have a question now, fantastic. Then we'll take some from YouTube and do another round of questions. So Humberside, come on up, guys. Go for it. Hello. 
Hi. So, so you were talking about this project where you're taking uh, the inner city streets to uh, the land. So I just wanted to know if you could uh, talk about some specifics about it, you know, like how many students you have doing that, uh, what they're going to do on the land, who's taking them there. So, uh, I'd just like to know a lot more about that whole project. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So like I said, it's, it's a bit delayed right now. We, we have some, uh, we have to put in some infrastructure into the land first. So we need road access. We need to dig a well. So these are, these are some of the things that we're going to have to fundraise for. Uh, we need to get a sea can on the land so we can store materials. Uh, like I, I'm going to, I'm going to send the bill to Trudeau because at one point he said that we need canoe storage. And so that's our canoe storage project is okay. Give us the canoe storage, please Trudeau. Um, because we have a lake there that we can go out on. So the idea is um, we want to work with uh, organizations who already uh, do this, this kind of programming for inner city youth. So in Edmonton here, uh, we have Bent Arrow uh, Society, for example, that works with um, a lot of inner city youth and, and kids in care. And, uh, you know, there's there's a there's so many groups doing the work. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. And because Molly and I and our other member, our other board member, we're, we're all busy. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to suddenly come up with the, all this this programming. What we're going to do is we're going to make sure that everything is set up on the land so that these organizations can bring groups out. And some of the things that are happening right now that we want to we want to tap into as well is throughout Canada there are indigenous groups that uh, put together like hide working workshops where they they take a moose hide and and they work with with youth to show them how to scrape the hide how to prepare the hide tan the hide and then use the hide later for projects and things like that and we really want people to come out onto the land um, and and have knowledge keepers do these these workshops with them you know whether it's like I, I used to think when I was when I was like uh, my kids, all of my kids were quite a bit younger. That it's a shame we don't have an Indigenous Boy Scouts, right? Like if I want my kids, my urban kids, to go out and learn how to like survive in the wilderness and build fires and stuff like that, I would have to join. I would have them join the girl or Boy Scouts. I was like, why don't we have something like that where we're taking kids out and and they're learning survival skills? Because if you've ever had that opportunity, it's it's awesome. Like to have. To just be able to like start a fire in any condition, it sounds like it sounds like well, that's not a very useful skill, but I think I think with all of this stuff going on right now with the pandemic, we're starting to realize that going back to some of those essential skills is actually quite important. You know, do we know how to grow our own food? Um, do can we recognize? Can we even recognize the spore of animals on the land we're at? Do we know which herbs are uh, medicinal? Do we know which herbs are edible? Do we know which herbs are are poisonous? Um, you know, and all of that. And I want we, you know, I want people to come out there and do research on uh, on on uh, you know prairie rewilding. You know, we used to have prairie grasses here when the buffalo roamed that went down root systems that went down like twenty feet or or more, and that sequesters so much carbon, um, much more so than trees. And if there's a fire, it just burns off the top layer, but the carbon's still in the soil. So there's all of these things that we could be doing on the land, research, cultural activities, you know, bringing, bringing kids out and learning skills. Um, it's sort of limitless. And, and so here I'm getting all excited about it again and frustrated that we can't do it right this second. But, uh, but COVID has slowed us down and now we have to, we, we can think about it a bit more and plan things out. But, you know, it's, it's really whatever resources you can tap into and that's why relationships are so important because do i know a hide worker yes can i get somebody out there can i get somebody out there to do uh stories in the winter because that's when we do our storytelling things like that it's it's anything that we set our minds to is what we're going to do out there i think next year what we'll do is we actually will end the broadcast at this point and send kids out like we'll set it up in advance we'll do it i will get out in nature and then they'll come back in like an hour and a half um that's That'd awesome, awesome. Uh, quick note, I uh, terribly sorry, if you want to end your screen share so you can see us a little better in the broadcast, you're welcome to do that. It's, it's not on the screen for us, but you can get rid of it. It might make it easier for you to see us for a conversation. Um, I, what I want to do now is bring up a question from Miss uh, Gill's class for joining us in Cambridge, Ontario. Uh, and so Kate in their class wants to know, what other books would you recommend for students to read, Chelsea? Oh man. Okay. So I love this because there's so many now, even just like 10 years ago, um, the list was small, um, you know, but oh gosh. Okay. Well, it really depends 
on what you want, right? Are you looking for information about, you know, are you looking for nonfiction about Indigenous peoples? Um, there's a lot of great memoirs out there, for example. So memoir is a genre where people talk about their lives. Um, and it can give you this really interesting insight into, um, you know, into their particular uh, experiences and you know often it, it spills over into the experiences of their communities so memoir is a big one um, you know you got David uh, David Robertson just came out with a, uh, a memoir you've got Jesse Thistle who talks about he's Métis talks about what uh, what it was like when he was homeless um, he's done a lot of work on sort of redefining Indigenous homelessness you've got Lindsay Nixon um, they have their memoir uh, Nitsnak uh, talking about growing up, you know, sort of in foster care in the prairies and talking about prairie kinship. And there, there's so many more. Okay, so there's memoir. You've got uh, um, Michael Hutchinson, who used to be a reporter on APTN, has is doing a series of uh, young adult mysteries set on on the res. So you've got like uh, the these this group of kids who goes around on the res solving mysteries. Uh, but it also gives you a lot of information about, you know, um, the 60 scoop, child welfare, things like that. Um, honestly, like there's so many books right now coming out written by Indigenous peoples that uh, your best bet is is bookstores more and more are curating lists. Um, now, if I were to say like if you were like, OK, but I need one book right now, um, I would say Arthur Manuel has two books. There's one. It's a. Uh, trying to remember it's like upsettling Canada and the reconciliation manifesto those two books give you a history of indigenous organizing you know throughout the decades and I think it's essential because it shows you how what's happening today hasn't improved that much and and the same people like he names names too so people in government now he talks about what they were doing 20 years ago and so you because I think it's really important that you, that you recognize um, the living conditions for Indigenous peoples in this country are not materially better than they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. Things are not getting better for us. And so it's easy to listen to all the rhetoric, the political rhetoric, and believe that because time passes, everything gets better. Those books will give you some really good grounding in sort of the history of, of all of that. Fantastic, Chelsea. That was a lot of resources. You mentioned Jesse Thistle. I was a name that was uh, familiar to me because we did a broadcast with him, I think, last year. That was one yeah. of the most popular uh, uh, Secret Path Week broadcasts we've ever done. So thank you for mentioning him. Arthur Manuel's books, again, on the screen. Check out Arthur Manuel. we got a lot of high schoolers today, so you guys are, are equipped to grapple with these issues to mm -hmm. talk about learn about this. Um, one thing for me personally that was really impactful was finding out about long-term boil water advisories. Oh, yeah. It's being talked about in the government now and, and in a lot of classrooms too. If you look up long-term boil water advisories and what long-term means and how long these have been in place across Canada, you will be absolutely shocked at how many people in Canada are not water secure, which is probably the most basic of human rights, most basic of things that we sort of think of in Canada. As you turn on the tap, you get fresh, clean water. Um, so I encourage you guys to check that out as well. And uh, Great questions, great answers, Chelsea. Um, all right, I want to go back to our live class for two more questions. Uh, and amazingly, we're nearing the end of the broadcast. Time flies and you're having fun. Yeah. But Miss Hall's class, if you guys want to come back in and ask another, and then we'll go back to Humberside in a minute. So Miss Hall, come on in and uh, go for it. Hi, thank you. One of my students wants to know um, when your creativity started, if you were very creative and artistic as a child. Oh yeah, I was a weird kid. Um, yeah, definitely. Like. Um, Actually, my mom was cleaning out some some stuff that she had recently, and she gave me a binder of this book that I I wrote when, <laughs> when I was like fifteen. Um, you know, it's like the equivalent of going back. You know, if you were on Live Journal or anything like that, and you were doing stuff online, fan fiction and whatnot, it was it was terrible. <laughs> I reread it, and I'm like, I'm so glad this is never going to make it out into the world. I made my kids promise never, never to to publish it. Um, but yeah, I I. Uh, you know, I was I was always a huge sci-fi nerd and and fantasy as well, right? It's really hard to sort of like draw a, a clear, bright line between fantasy and science fiction. And so I read, you know, you got to realize this is this mind blowing. I know, but I grew up before the internet. Like I was an adult when I got access to the internet. So for us, entertain entertainment was like you know whatever happened to be showing on TV at the time. There was no streaming. There was no on demand. So I would watch uh, Star Trek Next Generation with my family. That was a big deal. 
And um, I lived out in the country. So I would go to the Wobberman Public School Library um, and just, we would just get like two weeks worth of books and just sit there and read voraciously. So I read everything I could get my hands on, like literally read the section out. I read everything they had there. Um, and yeah, I think it, for me, it was that it was, it was uh, the best form of escapism. You know, I could, I could read these books and, and not be in the middle of nowhere, uh, not really loving school and everything. I could, I could imagine all these different worlds. And so that's never really stopped. And I didn't realize that there was a, a space for that. Cause I didn't, you know, it wasn't like I was hanging out with artists and writers and stuff. Like now I know artists and writers. Uh, I didn't know that was a possibility at the time at all. Um, I, I didn't even know going to university was a possibility. I'm the first person in my family to ever go to university. So I didn't realize when I was younger that creativity could take me anywhere. And now it's like, now I, now it's everything. Fantastic. Uh, I, it's amazing how many of the people we bring on this broadcast, and no matter what their topic is, that their origin story is that they read every book in the library. So get out, read uh, whatever genre you're interested in. It will lead to a lot of great things and hopefully end up uh, being as creative a person as Chelsea out of it. Um, all right. I want to go back to Humberside with a student right in front of the camera. Thanks, man. Uh, so come on in and uh, go for it. Yeah. Do you have any other projects lined up after you uh, do the ones that you've already thought of? Oh, wow. I mean, the land, the land project is going to be huge. Cause as I, as I said, like, there's so many things that we want to do. So I, a lot of my mental energy right now is on that. Um, uh, you know, we want to do, we want to build a tiny home. We want to like have a tiny home building sort of session. And then we want to have uh, writers and artists come out and do residencies on the land where they're sort of, they're out there for a couple of weeks you know, with food and everything and, and no distractions and just getting their work done because that's that's something I've discovered when I really had to do my um, my thesis and I had to sit down and, and write. Not having distractions makes a big deal. It makes a big difference in getting it done. Um, but actually, it's funny you say this because so I never wanted to be a nonfiction writer and I'm best known for this nonfiction book that I wrote, Indigenous Rights. I've started doing some fiction now that's being published, but I always wanted to, to write sci-fi. Um, and over this pandemic, I've been inhaling trashy thrillers. Like I never thought I would like that. I, I was like, no, I'm sci-fi to the core, but I really like trashy thrillers. And so I think I'm going to start writing some trashy thrillers in, in the new year, like just pure escapism. Like I'm do, you know, I want to do all this like real work on the ground, on the land with people, but I also want to just create trashy escapism because I find I have found during this this pandemic that it's been it's been huge to be able to read stories about people who make such bad decisions. It makes you feel better about your own life. You're like, wow, if you just communicated and didn't lie all the time and maybe didn't commit murder, um, life could be a lot simpler. So yeah, that's kind of what I've got planned. Ah, oh, that was glorious. Thank you for that answer. Um, we had uh, Miss Neely's class that also has the same thing, so we covered that. That's awesome. Um, by the way, you're the first person in the history of exploring by the seat of your pants to say that your next ambition is trashy tiller, so I appreciate that so much. Um, in fact, your candor in general, we're beginning the broadcast with, I have six children and I am exhausted. Thank you for that. Um, as opposed to, I can do it all and it's so easy. No. <laughs> no. Also, this has been a real pleasure. I, I want to wrap up in just a minute uh, for our students that are tuning in on YouTube Live. Uh, just a few resources to check out. Again, this is part of our, our Downey Wenjack Fund Seeker Path Week. So check out downywenjack.ca, amazing resources, education guides, and more. An incredible resource. If you want to check out some of our past videos on YouTube, you can do so uh, on our YouTube channel. Check out our Seeker Path Week lineup of programs past and in the next few days there. Um, and one of our partners over the last few years has been Canadian Geographic, which is partnered with Indigenous Communities for the Indigenous Peoples Atlas of Canada, which is a really beautiful series of books and, and information online um, and really, really informative covers uh, a, a huge, broad and, and almost comprehensive of, insofar as you can do that. Mm -hmm information on a lot of amazing things that you guys are keen to learn today so check that out and of course more importantly this place or 150 years retold Métis in space check those out Chelsea's resources are amazing so I hope you get a chance to do that when you're done the broadcast uh, Chelsea before we wrap up today is there any last message you'd like to share with our students tuning in uh, anything that they can take home as an action uh, item to do today when they leave this broadcast 
Yeah, I think the biggest thing you can do is is care. Um, all of us are super busy with our own lives, right? And it can feel really disempowering and overwhelming um, looking at the political situation. And, and this is true, not just in your generation, this is in every generation, right? The kinds of systems that we have in place um, are not working for any of us on this planet. They're, um, they're responsible for the destruction of so much habitat, uh, it's changing our climate. It's creating crises of of just unbelievable proportions, right? So it, it it can feel like we're in the apocalypse right now. So what I want you to take out of this is hope. Is is the fact that like we have ways of surviving, and none of those ways involve you know um, hiding in a in a sea can with your guns and stuff like that. The way that Indigenous peoples have, have have survived multiple apocalypses is by expanding our kinship, by caring for one another more, by paying attention to what's going on locally, um, and and making making those connections that allow us to be resilient. So you know that I think that's the most important thing you can do in your life in general, because all all of us experience moments in our life where everything just falls apart. And when that happens, we need to look around and see who's there to help us out. And if you don't have anybody, um, then you need to make those relationships stronger. That's true of individuals and communities of, of, of everything that's happening in our planet. So, you know, focus on relationships, focus on, on building meaningful, healthy relationships with other people, because that's what's going to get you through all of it as an individual and, and us as a human family. Yeah, uh, that's a beautiful message. Not one that we cover a lot in, in these broadcasts: empathy, kindness, relationships, connections with other people. So, thank you so so much for ending with that, and for a beautiful and very funny presentation today. Uh, I really appreciate it, and uh, I hope people do take up the call to, to do those relationships and to learn more about the amazing work that you've done and are are continuing to do uh, amidst COVID and for the years to come. Uh, Chelsea, what we want to wrap up with, what we always do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our teachers, so Humberside Collegiate, uh, Miss Hall, if you guys want to join me in saying a big thank you and goodbye to Chelsea today and thank you for joining us. You're all in the broadcast. Go for it. Thank you so, so much, guys.